What have you done? The sinner join us. Oh, man, I look so fresh and young. Why do I look so skinny, man? You handsome, Sammy. Man, Sam, you fine. All right. Sorry, guys. We're running a little late. This guy, he thinks he's the boss of me. You don't tell me what to do, dude. You're still not getting it, Daniel? You're going to wait as long as I make you wait, dude. You're not going to tell me what to do. We need the link. No, I thought you don't need the link. I thought you can get in magically. Man, this guy, bro, he pretends to be humble. Well, you can see, man, he's starting to like, you know, show dude, man. Oh, la, 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 la. we need the link, bro. No, really? I thought you was going to magically appear. Man, I'm about to block you live in the live stream. This is Christmas. What have you done? Yesterday was a day from hell for me. So glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. I wish I was. Ooh, was it a day from hell? I just want to know. Why is it even though I have cheat days, I still am lean and handsome and, and beautiful? Yeah. No, I'm just saying. Look at that, man. Look, 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 man. Look how beautiful I look. Stop the hate. And the cat wants attention. What's up, Mr. Hannah? Mr. Hannah, I haven't seen you, bro. Where you been? All right. We're waiting for them. We'll have a couple minutes late. Huge thing happened yesterday. Even though it was a day from hell yesterday, but something big. All I can tell you is God is answering your prayers. Miracles are taking place. I can't go mm -hmm. into detail. I don't want to come off as if I'm attacking or disrespecting. All I can do, all I can say is God is doing something miraculous and marvelous in my children's lives, in the life of their mother. It was, it's something miraculous. I can't go into detail. I don't want to come off as if I'm attacking or discrediting, but be that as it may. Just know your prayers are being heard. The Almighty God is doing something miraculous, just doing something glorious to rock and destroy that unbiblical union. It's miraculous. That's all I can say. I can just leave it there. But it was rough, rough day for me. What happened, sir? I just sent you the link, sir. What happened? I sent you the link, sir. Okay, this cat needs attention, man. This is Christmas. If he doesn't show up, we're probably going to have to cancel. I don't know. And then right, I have a stream scheduled, God willing, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time, Michigan time. I have a stream scheduled. You don't want to miss that because we're going to go super in-depth in the exegesis of the Gospel of John regarding the glorious, blessed Holy Spirit, the glorious... Blessed Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious, blessed Father, the Trinity. Super in-depth. It's going to be very deep exegesis. If the Holy Spirit is pleased to use my tongue to glorify Father, Son, Lord Jesus Christ Almighty, and the eternal Holy Spirit. So 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then Lord willing, we'll talk about the Christmas message. I plan on doing a Christmas message, Lord willing, for December 25th. And another Christmas message for January 6th, January 7th, because many of you may not know this. The Armenian Apostolic, right? Mm. Orthodox Church celebrates January 6th. And there are others who celebrate January 7th. So we're going to have at least two Christmas messages if the Lord Jesus wills. May the Lord use me in spite of my sins and forgive me and crush, crucify my flesh to walk worthy of Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Sick and damaged, and I need healing. Yeah, glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. So this is Christmas. There's only two of you today. What happened, man? What have you done? Oh, la, 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 la. No, it's December 25th, January 6th, and January 7th, Sarah. Why are you being so disrespectful to the Armenians, Sarah? In your world, it's only December 25th, January 7th. Did you not hear me say that the Armenian... Apostolic Orthodox Church celebrates January 6th. Sister, why? Armenians are not Christians? Is there not Calvinists? All right, well, these guys are here, but I don't know what they're doing. This, so this is Christmas. This cat needs a lot of attention. 
And why doesn't he give me attention? Why is it always me having? Okay. You guys are what? Are you like praying right now? What's it? Uh, Rachel Petty. My thoughts are it's not relevant to the topic, sister. Let's keep it focused on the topic. Please don't ask irrelevant questions. Please, sister. Please. We need to stay focused. There's a topic. We don't want people to go off topic. I look like Bruce Willis. I thought I'm better looking Bruce Willis. Why are you hating like this? I look very young, right? When I shave it. But people say, no, I'll have a beard. Yeah, so I can look old, right? I see how you are. Guys, are you here? Are you waiting for the rapture to be left behind? We're here. So what happened? It's like uh, you guys not saying anything. Um, today, I think we were going to start with Madge's presentation. Yes. Because he left off at a certain place, and then after a while, we might uh, dive back into mine, just to okay. continue those Ephesus yes. father's quotes. He continue where he left off, and so let's continue because guys, the big guns are coming after you. January thirteen, Doctor Goff, Father Capus, William Albrecht, respond to you guys, and then in February, these Orthodox guys are coming, man. So you better be on your A game. I'm letting you know. But anyway, so go ahead. Let's continue where we left off by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we're ready um, for uh, Dr. Goff William. We're very excited for that um, because we, we there's a lot of mutual respect and uh, we're very cordial and uh, charitable with each other. By so, the way, sir, I just want to say something to you. You're not the boss of me. You don't tell me what to do in text messages, Daniel. What okay, I say, you know, you're trying to boss me around, sir. We need the link, bro. Like I didn't know you needed the link, sir. I thought maybe you forgot. I don't know. It's okay, sir. I know you're a nice guy, but people don't know you're bossy, dude. I just want to come I visit like, you. For I, I like the I like the beard look, Sam. Why did you shave? I because like I need to look younger. Listen, you're married. God bless your family. I got no hope. So I'm doing everything I can to look like I'm in my you 20s. Have hope. You have hope. No, I'm talking about worldly speaking. We know we have hope in heaven. I'm talking no, about no, hope. you have hope even here. I don't know. That doesn't feel like it. You know, it doing is. Christmas by myself, but it's okay. I just want to sing a song before say, you get it. I want to say, Sam, something from you got you remember Sam last week? There was the guy, he was saying uh he was in the live stream we did with you last week in the comments. He said uh, he wants to debate us metaphysics, philosophy separated from all the content. I, yeah, what was his name? Uh, Astro. So yes. uh, this guy, and you told me, you said, uh, you said, these are Muslim tactics, right? Yeah. So smart you called it because it turns out the guy, we thought he was Catholic. I'm sorry to the Catholics. I'm sorry to the Wagner group. Uh, we Not the Russian militia, the, the, the SCOTUS Thomas online. I'm sorry to you guys because I thought he was one of you. Um, and it turns out he's actually a Persian Shia guy. See? I knew it. And, yeah. Um, now, to be fair to him, he uh, he's leaving that, I think. He's been trying to get baptized for five years or something. So he's been brother, trying to do what? Get baptized. He's been a catechumen. Oh, oh, so, oh, I see. Okay, so he yeah, is embracing I Christianity. Heard, I heard he's a catechumen, but it's been five years that he's been a catechumen. It shouldn't take that long. Whatever the situation is. Yes. Uh, brother, when you get baptized, maybe we could talk. In the meantime, if you want to do Muslim apologetics, Sam's yes. your guy. Um, let, yeah, let me let me explain because people don't know the backstory. Uh, yeah. Let me tell you guys, me personally, let me just explain. I need everyone to hear me out carefully because this is going to set the stage for the upcoming sessions. Me personally, me, and I'm not the standard, so I say this just my own preference. I'm not the standard. God doesn't care what I think. At the end of the day, your opinion of me doesn't mean anything. My opinion of you doesn't mean anything. This is the fact. It doesn't. So you can think I'm a heretic. Who gives a damn? Uh, if the Lord Jesus has saved me, or you may think I'm a saint, but I'm on my way to hell. So it is arrogance on our part. It is arrogance on my part. And I'm quite arrogant when I say this guy's a heretic because God will say, no, you're the heretic. May God have mercy on us. Now, me... When people tell me, let's debate the logical consistency of miaphysitism or the logical consistency of diaphysitism, that doesn't impress me. 
because since I've come into the Christian faith, there have been anti-Trinitarians mm -hmm. who've been attacking, who've been attacking the Trinity, not miaphysitism or diaphysitism, the Trinity for being logically incoherent. The most infamous of which is Muslim meta retard, who goes by the name Muslim metaphysician. Metaphysician, I call him Jake the Snake, Muslim meta retard. What does he do? Challenge Christians why the Trinity is logically inconsistent. That doesn't impress me. Just because there's something I may not comprehend, I may not understand, and it's beyond my ability to comprehend, if it's scriptural, if it's based on scripture, if it's revelation from God, and this is what the Christians believed prior to the schism, that's what will convince me because I know God is an infinite mind. No matter how much I try to figure out God, there's a limit because he's beyond my ability to comprehend. So to try to tell me, well, diaphysitism or miaphysitism is logically incoherent, that may impress you. It doesn't impress me. I want to know, is it scriptural? Does it contradict scripture? And is this what the pre-schism Christians believe? This is what matters for me. So when someone tells me, if you take the Tuknuma to its logical conclusion, you end up with two persons. Well, if that's the route you want to go, they're not going that far. They're saying, this is the limit. So to me, I don't care how far you want to take it and where you land due to the logical inference or conclusion of a set system. For me, is it pre-schism Christian teaching? Did the Christians believe this before the schism? And is it anchored scripture? Or at the very least, does it contradict scripture? That's what matters to me. So when I say, hey, may have physicists and rational, Muslims tell me the Trinity is irrational. God being born is irrational. I don't want to hear it. So go ahead, brother. Uh, and just to, to tag, uh, follow what you're saying with an example, uh, there's a guy, the online community remembers him, Xavier. He was a, a very known Roman Catholic apologist. And because he was in danger, he was doing this, what Sam is warning against, kind of going off into this philosophy. He's taking a cheap shot at you guys. I don't mean to cut you out. That's okay. We'll talk about it. Cheap shot. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, well, the, you're about Xavier, to get very quiet. Xavier, when he, he, he fell into the danger of what Sam is and he was respected by everybody, you know, but when he fell into the danger of what Sam is saying about this philosophy, metaphysics, following consistent logic, whatever the heck, now he's agnostic, atheist, Muslim. He's like, wait, he's, he left Christianity. He's out. And you have... You have guys like uh, what's his name? Um, Autobot Decepticon, AutoZone. What's his name? Aut Aut Automobile I can't accident. Say that name. You want me to know the name? Uh, uh, no, uh, they know the the other uh, Auto. Uh, 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 Majid, he's talking to you, Maggot, to say something. Automatic Dog Eater. What's his name? Autocratic. Yeah. Auto autocratic. Autocratic. Uh, and, and, I thought it was Star and, Byzantium. Something and, like that. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. and uh, and Astro, that would be a good one because both of them separate everything and just talk about philosophy. They can philosophize with, with each other. But for us, this is not the way we do it. We always yeah. keep everything together with the Christian, with scripture, with patristics, with tradition. Now, I want three schism sources, statements, what the Christians believe prior to schism. That's what led me out of Protestantism. If you guys don't understand what led me out of Protestantism. I looked at what the Christians taught when they were still in communion. Christians historically before the 400s. When I saw what they believed up until the 5th century, I knew I couldn't remain Protestant anymore. So then my journey was to discover which of the churches then continued in a linear progression that was faithful to the ancient deposit and didn't stray from it. This is my journey. But anyway, brethren, go ahead. Now, by the way, Maggot. Please, when he asks you a question, answer, Maggot. Please. Sure, I, I, I wasn't sure it was to me. So, so, and I, I want to say about the Apollinarian comment that was there. The funny thing is, whether you're Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic, you can't say that. Why? Because Ephesus 431 uses what you call Apollinarian forgeries as dogma, as the, they give them in the Council of Ephesus. Okay. Um, so, uh, in, if you accept the Council of Ephesus, you are accepting that these so-called forgeries are not forgeries. Craig Trulia, he, he 
he concedes the point. He says, yeah, these we can't say these are Apollinarian forgeries because we accept Ephesus. So if you accept Ephesus, you can't call them Apollinarian forgeries. And like I said in many other streams, um, the most primitive, safest, traditional Christology is our Christology, and you're going to see as we continue. So let's start. Okay. Let's go, guys, because I want to bring you back Friday because we already missed too many days. But Lord mm -hmm. willing, if you're free... Maggot, are you free Friday or you're not going to be able to do Friday again? Uh, I'm not sure, completely sure, like this week. Uh, I will tell you, like, maybe tomorrow or something like that. Well, yeah, we, we, we are trying to get at least two sessions in to make up for lost time because I don't want to speed you up, but I want you to do your series so that we can be done before February. So, but if you can't do Friday, what is it about you on Friday? You're not a Muslim. You don't do Juma prayers. <laughs> no, but I, ha I have church uh, on Fridays. Oh, okay. With the, with the youth, so that's why. Okay, begin, guys. If you're ready for the start, let's get into the meat of the matter. Okay, one second. I will just share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes, go ahead. Now let me put this in the front. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so last time we were talking about uh, the metaphysical, uh, metaphysical terms that we use, Gnoma or Iposasis, Usi, and so on, and we expl uh, explained them. And we left off where we were talking about if the two natures are completely gone. And so we said that counting them or enumerating them as two, yes, in that sense, they're gone. But in quality, meaning what the natures are, meaning the world remaining word and the flesh remaining flesh, no, they exist according to quality. And that's what St. Cyril says uh, in several writings. But I use two here to show that he says that the difference of the natures, which is what we call the qualities, remain. Uh, because Godhood and manhood are not, not the same thing in quality of nature. So, for instance, immortal is not mortal. And, and incorruptible is not corruptible. And so on. So these things that distinguish the natures, they remain because the flesh doesn't become divine by nature. Nor does the word change his nature. But both of them remain what they are. And in, in that sense, uh, you can you can speak of two natures in the mind to enumerate the difference. But in reality, he says that they become one through composition. And yeah, I I think we read these last time, right? Yes, yes. I was gonna just. I'm not gonna ask you too many questions because I think people understood the theology. But so. You're quoting St. Cyril. So if someone points to statements where St. Cyril still speaks of two natures, uh -huh. so see, he used both languages, two natures, one composite nature. Could they then use that as an argument, you see, so that it's really semantics because we're both saying the same thing at the end of the day? No, because the, the issue isn't about just the terms two natures, one nature. It's what does he mean by them? So, for instance, we don't completely deny two natures. It's two natures of the union. So the issue isn't him using the terms two natures, because as we saw before, when I was citing the same letter to St. Acacius, the first time we had our stream, I was say, uh, showing that St. Cyril accepted the terms two natures. And he said that Nestorius isn't condemned because he says two natures, just like two natures by themselves, because two natures indicates a difference is that he doesn't unite them and get one incarnate nature out of them. So the issue isn't just him using the terms two natures. What does he mean by that? And so that's the, that's the question. When he uses two natures, is he speaking about in reality? Well, of course not, because as we've seen, he's condemning two natures of the union. What okay. is he speaking about? He says in other writings, I ha like I haven't cited them in this particular PowerPoint, but I have like, the sources. He speaks about two natures only theoretically, only in the mind. So he's mind. clear what he says when he says two natures. It's only in the mind we can perceive two natures. But what, what we look at, what we touch and so on, that's one incarnate nature. Okay. All right. You got it. Continue, my brother. Okay. So the question is then, so this one nature, is it like one nature of divinity and humanity? No. So this is a Syriac Orthodox saint. He was a patriarch. St. Michael the Great, and he explains that when we speak of one nature, we do not say one nature and one knoma or hypostasis for the divine and the human. Why? Because the divine and the human aren't identical. They aren't one nature. 
one for instance humanity is one nature divinity is one nature but humanity and divinity together i mean by themselves aren't one nature they're not identical he says we say that the composite christ is one nature and one gnoma or one composite gnoma meaning they together form form up a composite being but in themselves they're not one nature one in nature because they're not the same thing in nature so that's a misconception that many uh, bring oh is divinity and humanity the same thing no they're not the same thing they're not one nature and one knoma by themselves because they're not identical but they form up one nature one composite nature and one composite knoma so then the question is what does one mean because we can use the term one but we have to understand how one can be applied because one can be applied uh, differently in certain contexts contexts so sincerely he explains in his second letter to successors he says the term one can properly be applied uh, not just to those things which are natural simple so for instance god we say one god because he's natural simple but also to things which are compounded compounded in a synthesis so he says you can call things that are composite one even though they're not simply one but you still call them one because they form up a composite being a composite thing such is the case with a human being who compresses compromise uh, compresses soul and body so i will be using the soul and body analogy later on because that's what saint solo says these are quite different things and they're not consubstantial with each other yet when they are united they constitute the single nature of man uh, notice this because actually the Casedonians uh, denied that man is one nature out of two when it comes to soul and body and th you can see here Saint Cyril saying that the bow soul and body they constitute the single nature of man even though the difference sorry no I'm saying so Saint Cyril is clear what he means that they're two but in after the union they're one because like soul and body makes the one nature of man you can't speak exactly. of two natures exactly so i want to understand the quotes because you see you already have some catholics who can't behave themselves most of the catholics are behaving themselves and when i've told them the catholics will come and give their presentation but be patient you got two manifesting already claudio and union that's what i'm going to send them you know on their merry way let them people give you the quotations let them make their presentation you can agree to disagree but respect yourselves and be patient until you hear your guys come and present but understand what saint cyril is saying in this quote i just want to i'm not going to stop you i just want everyone here saint cyril's likening the two natures of christ after the union to a soul and body of a man though there are two parts it's still one nature you don't speak of two natures you guys get it just like man is soul and body but we don't speak of two natures of man it's still one nature made of soul and body so he's saying that this is the analogy that saint cyril is giving christ after the union has a divine and human nature but we don't speak of them as two it's one composite nature but go exactly, ahead because the term one doesn't only mean it, 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 it like it's not applied to just simple things like only divine only human it can be something that's one composed of many things so that's uh, that's why he uses man because man isn't simply just soul and body we we still call man one but we know that man even though he is one he's not simply soul or body but he's both together yeah. so i want people to understand me sites do not deny jesus is truly human truly divine of so are you hearing it so no misrepresentation and they don't believe in a mixture guys exactly. be respectful and love them even if you don't agree with their position they don't believe jesus is not human or not divine he's truly human true and divine but it's one nature so go ahead brother continue thank you even though the difference in nature of the things that are brought into unity is still present within the system of the composition so what he's saying here this is very, very important when you have a composition and two or more things unite in that system the differences remain so th something can have contradicting properties in it why because it's composed that's the purpose of it something can be like, like a human being it can be material like the body and immaterial at the same time both are contradicting things but because of what composition implies 
both contradicting properties can exist in this one nature because that's what a, a composition entails. So he says, so those who say that if there is one incarnate nature of God, the word, then it necessarily follows that there must have been a mixture or confusion with the human nature being diminished or stolen away are talking rubbish. So he, again, this sounds like the Chalcedonians when they say, oh, you have a mixed nature. I like the comments you just said, oh, they have to be confused or something. No, he's saying those who do that, they're talking rubbish because one incarnate nature isn't just simply the word or simply the flesh, but both together, together in unity, in oneness. Hmm. Thank God for your clarification, guys. So you see, it's not mixed. It's not compounded. And he's truly human, truly divine. But in the union, it's one nature. We don't speak of two. So guys, make sure you represent them honestly, even if you disagree. Go ahead. So this is an, uh, a diagram I made explaining the unity between like the soul and body. So you have in, in, in our minds, in this like square or rectangle, you have soul and body separately. They're not the same thing. Two different colors, two different natures. Both of them have their own will and energy, meaning activity. So when you consider them by themselves, there are two. Two knome or two hypostases or two natures. Okay? But, uh, and, and the prosopon or parsopa is located in the soul. That's where the consciousness, that's where the personhood is located. But when in reality, how does man exist as one nature? Is he mixed? No. As you can see, uh, this one circle, like the one down here, I don't know if you can see my mouse here. This one is made out of these two. And these two walls and these two energies are working in synergy. Because, for instance, the man doesn't talk without the soul doing that. The soul is acting through the body. The fathers call the soul, uh, sorry, the body, the instrument of the soul. And so the fathers use this analogy because they see the body and soul of Christ as the instrument of the word or the divinity. So as you can see here, because some Chalcedonian objections are, oh, so uh, if Christ has one energy or will, uh, how does he have like different activities or different things he, he's done? There is a yeah. distinction between the products of energy, the things done, meaning, for instance, talking, sleeping, feeling anxious and so on, and the performer, the, perf the, 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 the active movement happening, the thing being actualized. That's one thing. And the things being done, they're different. Sure. But it's still the one being doing them, this one energy and will. And the things being done are diverse because he is not composed of one, he's not simply soul or body, but this one being doing these different things is composed of two different things. Yeah. Now, remember, it's it's not too technical, but technical enough that you're going to confuse at least someone like me. So let's now we're going to have to slow it down a little bit so we can get it. Those who already know your theology understand, those who are into philosophy understand. But someone like uh, Vartan, full arm apologetics, who's in kindergarten, he needs a little help. Okay. So let me repeat what yours, you said. And the human, the human being, the soul is the parsopa. For those of you who forgot what parsopa means or prasopan, that's the word for person. So it is the human soul that is the person. It's your soul that makes you a person. That gives you your personality, which is amazing because glory to God, if the fathers thought this, that was something that I reasoned within myself. So thank the Lord. At least I'm not going against what the church thought. So I'm a human. I am soul and body, but we don't speak of two natures in me. It's one nature, right? So that's one nature. And you would also say I'm one panuma, right? Yes. One instantiation, right? Yes. So as a one, as one human, I'm one panuma. One example of human nature, but that human nature has soul and body, but you don't speak of two natures because it's soul and body, and it's the soul that makes me a person. So we got that? It's the soul that makes me a person, right? Yes. And the soul is using my body as her instrument, if we speak yes. of soul and feminine. Okay. Now, coming to Christ so we can understand this. 
Yeah, I, ha I have an almost like I have a diagram for that. Uh, I think yes. it was uh, because you said you went into the will and energies, and that's where I got lost. Okay, so okay. The, those who tell you because you believe, so people understand, in the Miaphysite tradition, Christ has only one will. Yes, one theandric will, meaning divine human will, and one theandric energy, meaning divine human energy or activity. Okay, so. When you say theandric, the, these are two Greek words, theos and, and dear. Yeah, divine human. That's why I said that. Yeah, that's how I'm helping them. Maggot, I love you, sir. I'm helping these guys. You're using technical terms because you want to sound intelligent so people think you're older than you are. Let me help these people like full armor who's in kindergarten. Theandric is two words, theos, God, and endear, man. So it's one divine human will. So now explain that to people. What do you mean divine and human? You're okay. not confounding the natures. You're not confusing them. So if it's one will, and you're saying it's divine human will, what does that mean exactly? Okay. So first of all, it's related to what Christ is, what his nature is, right? It's it's divine and human. And so everything that Christ does and wills is divine human. So he never acts or wills simply as man or simply as God, but both together. So this energy or this will is stemming th from his one incarnate nature. And since this one incarnate nature is divine and human, everything he does is as God made man. And not simply as God, meaning the, just the divine energy, or just simply as man, meaning the, just the human energy. God, but man. always together in synergy. Okay, now let me, let me ask you this question then. The will... Yes. Because you're saying he always does things as the God man. The God man. So he doesn't do something as God or man. He does it as the God man. So Jesus died. That's the God man dying. He died yes. a human death. Okay. Now, my question to you is then in this view, the will, is it a characteristic of parsopa or is it a characteristic of nature? It is a characteristic of uh, nature. Okay, but it is actualized, meaning like set in motion or be becoming real through the gnoma, and yes. the one performing it, like setting it in motion, let's say, is the parsopa. Yeah, so let's yeah, so to make it a little simple, see, it's, that's why you guys are going to need a lot of sessions so we can get it together. So I thought we can speed it up, but now you're going technical. So so people understand. You said the will is the characteristic of nature. Yes. But the will is only going to be something real <clears throat> due to a kanuma. In other yes. words, I'm a human kanuma. I have human nature. But because I am a kanuma, an example of human nature, I then am able to make that human will that's part of human nature a reality in my own existence Exactly. By virtue of the fact that I'm a person. Yes. Okay, but you, you see, so now understand if I take that, and I'm not because I'm trying to understand. So mm -hmm. it ends up that the reason why I have a will is because, for example, if you have a stone that's knuma, it has mm -hmm. no will. Yes. So why wouldn't you then say the will is simply a characteristic of parsopa, person? The thing is, I mean, sure, the... the First of all, will is is proper, like like I said, it's actualized through the gnoma, right? But it has to be a parsopa, a person, who actualizes it. Since but, the stone doesn't back. have a parsopa. Yeah. Sorry? Let me, yeah, but let me ask, see, but that's my point. You're saying a gnoma actualizes it. No, it's the person that does. Because if you have a gnoma that's not a parsopa, then there is no will to actualize. So uh, why don't you end up saying it's simply a characteristic of the person? Because in, if it was simply a characteristic of the person, then yes. you'd have like end up with three wills in the Trinity. So if it, it is proper to just press parsopa and you have like three parsopa in the Trinity, then you have like three wills. So that's what so it that's, is. So because you don't believe there are three wills in the divine nature. Yeah. I see. So you can't say that the will is a characteristic of person because if you have three persons then there are three wills and you don't want that because you believe that in the godhead father and Holy spirit have the same will yes and the thing the thing also is 
it's very will is so, something something proper to a rational like entity something rational right if i see that brother you're going to make it harder for all of us when you say rational rationality again is not necessarily a property of knuma because you can have a stone that's a knuma and has no rationality so then it ends up becoming the parsopa so this is where you're going to end up confusing us with the terminology so just so we can understand what you're saying the will the will Yes. is not to be ascribed to the parsopa, the person. Because if you ascribe will to the person, if there are three persons in the Godhead, there are three wills, and the, the Miaphysites don't believe that. There's only one divine will. Yes. So that you're now saying that the will is a characteristic of nature, but since mm -hmm. the nature of Christ is composite, you're now speaking of one composite will, but then that, does that mean since it's still a divine and human nature that's united, you're saying the will is divine and human? Yes. This okay. one will is composed of divine and human will. will. So then reality, there are two wills, but in their unity, it's one. Not in reality. Yeah, in their unity, but in contemplation, like you can see here, like the one with the soul and body, there are two, right? Because there are two natures. But in reality, how they act, they act as if they were like one thing or one will, one will and energy. Yeah. Yeah, so what I'm saying is basically, since the two natures are now one composite nature, mm -hmm. and you don't speak of two, so it's really two wills that have now become unified as one. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. All right, go ahead. Now, this is why after these series, I'm going to get more confused than I've ever been in my life. So I thought I was smart, but you guys show me how stupid I am. Go ahead. I just, we needed the clarification. It's because yeah, we need to understand. Of course. Go ahead. Of course. Go ahead. So... So when we speak of two in reality, especially when we speak about the human being, it's when they're separated. So in the mind, like when, when a human being die, when a human being dies, he's one in our minds. Like for instance, let's say me, oh, someone thinks of me as soul with body. But in reality, when I die, soul and body become separated. That's when they become two natures. So a human being in let's say more philosoph philosophical terms in actuality in reality he is one nature but he can potentially become two natures when when two when the, the two natures constituting the one nature become separate meaning okay. that let me let me uh, repeat what you said about the human i i don't know if i misheard you because i'm still trying to process yeah. everything this is very deep and I'm, i appreciate it you guys are helping me you're taking me a higher level you said in the human being uh -huh. The soul and body are one nature, but did yes. I hear you say if they separate, they become two natures? Yes. So that's when they, in, in reality, become two because they, they don't cease to exist. Like It's not like the soul is being merged with the body or mixed, and so the, it ceases to exist. No, it exists with the body, and it yeah. is separated with the body and is counted as two, like soul and body, two natures, when, when man dies. That's when separation happens. So at death, a human soul can now be considered a separate nature, even yes. though human nature entails soul and body. Yes. But if you separate them, now you can see there are two natures. Yes. Okay. A lot of metaphysical underpinnings. Go ahead. Continue. So this is an example from St. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa. He's also a uh, priest. Cousin. Do you want to read it, Subdeacon Daniel? Yeah, I think Daniel's talking to you either. Okay. Uh, you want me to read the whole thing or just the bold? Uh, I think it is better to read the whole thing. I don't know because the context is good here. All right. Yeah, but before you read Daniel, so they understand. Yes, he's saying if the divine nature and human nature could separate in Christ, they'd be two natures. Exactly. Just like all separates from the body they'd be two natures but because the divine and human natures are inseparable they can never be separated from christ after the incarnation so they'll never be two exactly what do we say the human being is both body and soul together or only one of them it is clear surely that the joining of the two of them is characteristic of the living being it makes no sense to spin out a discussion of what is disputed and well-known. 
And since this is so, let us consider another point in addition. Shall we say of the human acts such as adultery, murder, theft, and whatever is in that category, or on the other hand, of sobriety, continence, and every activity opposed to vice, that they are the achievements of both parts, or do we define these actions as restricted to the soul by itself? Is not the truth obvious here as well? For the soul is never separated from the body when it undertakes theft or carries out a burglary, nor is it indeed alone when it gives bread to the hungry or drink to the thirsty, or when it makes eager haste to the prison to care for the one distressed by imprisonment. But in every one of these acts, each part is united with the other and performs it jointly. Saint Gregory. Thank you, Thank you Daniel. And now, so before you want, guys, you understand the quote, what he just quoted? Now, maybe you can answer this question pretty later. Do you understand this quote from Gregory? If uh, when I do something, you don't say my soul did it, or you don't say my body did, like oh my body slept. You do not distinguish which part of you did the action. You as one unified person did it. So this is what Gregory is saying, basically, right? Yes. So he's saying so, everything. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to make sure people got it. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was saying like, so this is also an analogy for Christ, but like to explain this more, he's saying that the soul does everything, even the good deeds, like the virtues and the vices through the body. You cannot just say, oh, the, the, the body committed uh, theft or it was yeah. the soul. No, both together. Yeah. Because the yeah. soul yeah. acts through the body. Yeah. So everyone getting it. So just like you would not say, oh, Sam's body slept and Sam's soul sinned. No, Sam as that one unified person, soul and body sinned or slept. So we yes. don't separate that one part of me did one action. The other part of me did another action. It's that one person who did the action. So this exactly. is what he's saying that in Christ, it's one unified will that is doing the thing so now exactly. this may help our sister because she had a question then what does it mean when jesus says father take this cup away from me yet not my will but your will be done if the will of the father Son, Holy spirit is one and christ has only one unified will why does it seem like there's two wills there so, so this is oh yeah go ahead Brother okay, Nicholas. so the ways that the holy fathers explain this generally speaking and saying gregory the theologian goes in like the most depth about that particular passage. Basically, the explanation is that if this was the language, I'm paraphrasing here when I um, speak about this, St. Gregory, but he says that if this were the language of the nature he assumed, rather than the one who assumed our nature, then it would seem to indicate that there are two opposing wills. But because Christ would not oppose will to will, the meaning of the phrase has to be taken in this way, that not as I will, for there is none of mine which is not common to us. Yeah, that's what I was saying. As we have one Godhead, so we have one will. And yeah. so like parts of that are com are direct quotations. Yeah, I, I actually thought, I thought that would be the answer because I was trying to reason my mind. But right. Because you're such a theological genius. I'm going to simplify it in a minute. Go ahead. So basically, and unfortunately in this presentation, we don't have any stuff on the wills as it regards, you know, patristic florilegium. But eventually, um, after the nature's stuff, we're going to cover the will stuff and we're going to show how the fathers interpreted this verse. And also, we're going to go into the very important history of how the Chalcedonians uh formed this weird idea of two opposing wills and if they say that they're not opposing then why is your primary text gethsemane yeah yeah don't jump ahead of us because we don't know gethsemane it almost sound like you're calling me to middle eastern appetizer like hummus but coming back to the explanation because these fathers were theological philosophical geniuses this is basically what was being said when jesus says, yet not my will but your will be done it's to show because I don't have any other will but yours. Your will is my will. So there isn't some other will that would be in conflict with your will. So let me repeat for Kiri Leison. The fathers are saying this language is meant to emphasize they don't have different wills. It's the opposite. Yet not my will, but your will be done. 
as a way of saying, because I don't have a will other than yours. Your will is my will. That's how they interpret it. So, Kitty, did that help you, sister? And I was thinking about that as maybe that's how they'd explain it, especially because of John 6, 38. I did not come down to do my will, but the will of him who sent me, because his will is my will, and I have no other will but his. Did everyone get it? Right. Yes. See, now, yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. You got to make it simple, so you need someone stupid like me who can make it simple, because you're dealing with these fathers who are geniuses. They're like beyond our ability, but I, I figured out this is what they're going to say. So did you guys get it? Because I don't want to keep stopping guys. If I stop these guys, we won't finish till I see my grandchildren. But everyone got it because it defeats the purpose. You don't get it. You want to get it. So Kitty Lason, you got it? Okay, yeah, see, she got it. Okay, yeah, so Jesus. Another thing that I just want to point out about uh, the enumeration exactly. of wills is that even Chalcedonians will say that there are two wills that are proper to Christ. They will, And so they're not saying that person there is what, enumerates will or operation what we say enumerates will and operation is entity now christ is one composite entity and this is throughout the writings of saint cyril and uh, various fathers and we also say that the holy trinity is one entity but not as a composite entity as a simple entity and so because the christ and the trinity both amount to one entity, and we can't say two or three entities for either, or else we go into extremely explicit Nestorianism or extremely explicit tritheism. Yeah. Yeah, this well, is how we keep a consistent enumeration, and we'll eventually go into how you can have a composite oneness of the entity of Christ yeah. as well as the simple uh, oneness of the Trinity's entity. You know what I'm gonna have to do? I'm gonna have to do like a private correspondence with you guys to try to hammer in your head you're speaking too technical too fast because you just confused me at least when you said Christ is one entity and it's an entity that exercises volition, but the Trinity is also one entity. So it almost came out like sounding modalistic. See, this is what happens when you speak fast and you don't define your terms. I know you guys are young and excited. Define your terms because you just came off as affirming modalism, which was not your intention. So let's keep it simple, brethren, for the sake of me and everyone else. Because let me explain what you just said. Because Christ is one entity, then the action and the will will be one. Because it's the entity that wills and acts. But the Trinity is also one entity. All right, now, for in my mind, wait. If Christ is one entity, he's one person. If the Trinity is one entity, you're saying the Trinity is one person? You see what you do when you don't define your terms? Now, I understand that's not what you mean. But you got to define your terms. Stop speaking fast and too technical. Keep it simple like they say stupid. But in this case, keep it simple, saint. You get my point, guys? For the benefit of your audience, because you guys know this stuff. If you want the people to see why your position is the true position, or at least why it's not heretical, bring your audience along with you. Speak yeah, to yeah. them, not to Maggot, or whom you call Maggot, and try to impress him. Look, Maggot, I'm smarter than you. No, I'm smarter Speak to your audience and bring them along with you so they can understand what you're saying. So to repeat for everyone else about the will thing. So Kitty Lason, everyone got it? That these passages are meant to teach the opposite. Not that Jesus has a distinct will from the Father. They're not the same person. But to hammer that the reason why Jesus says, I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me, is because... He has no other will but the will of the Father. The reason why I don't come to do my will, because I don't have a will other than the will of the Father. His will is my will. So when he prays, when he prays and he says, Father, let this cup pass for me, yet not my will, but your will be done. It's his way of affirming. The reason not my will is because I don't have any other will but yours. Your will is my will. So everyone got that? Can you understand what they're saying? So with that said, continue, brother. Okay, so this was, again, an analogy to explain how Christ, or the Word, performs everything through the flesh. Uh, and here is something that St. John Chrysostom says. Do you want to read it, uh, Sadiqan? So, so truly, it is our way also, when we talk of man, to speak things both high and low, or when we say... 
that man is nothing, man is earth, man is ashes. We name the whole man from the inferior part. But when we say that man is an immortal animal and that man is rational and related to the higher beings, we again name the whole man from the superior part. So also with Christ, sometimes Paul speaks of him from the inferior part and sometimes from the superior part. Yes, so this is important because man, the whole man, uh, uh, refers to the one nature of man. And so sometimes we refer to man from his soul. For instance, man is a, a, a man is an immortal animal. Man is rational and related to higher beings. And sometimes from from the body, man is earth, man is ashes and so on. So the same thing with Christ. Sometimes we refer to him as like mortal, corruptible and so on from the body. And sometimes from the divine things, from the divine part, meaning the word, meaning immortal and so on. But they all refer still to the one whole, to one to, to the one composite nature. Again, this is an analogy to explain how you can speak of different things, inferior and higher parts, yet of the one being, in this case, Christ or man, as the analogy, uh, as the analogy says. So, uh, so to get it, what you guys are saying, because Christ is one being, so that you can ascribe all the actions to that one being, so that if he sleeps, it's the God man, that one being doing it. It's yes. not the man doing it. Just like when the brother was trying to say, the Trinity is one entity, one being, that means there will be one. And if Jesus is one being, his will be one. So now it's sinking in. So, okay, go ahead, brother. Now, by the way, guys, they're quoting early church fathers. They're quoting theologians. Not all of them are fathers, but John Chrysostom is the golden mouth. These are all saints. John Chrysostom, I don't know if anyone thinks he's a heretic. He's a saint in all the traditions. And they're quoting, this is their explanation, how to describe the actions of Christ. You don't divide the actions to one nature or the other. You speak of that one unified entity, unified being, doing the actions. So the God-man slept. The God-man raised the dead. Go ahead. Right. Exactly. And uh, as you can see, you have the sources. So if anyone is doubting that we're just like pulling up these sources out of thin air, you have the sources here, homily one on Hebrews. Uh, so this is also what St. Severus, so this is a post schism father, St. Severus, but it's to show how he's in a line with uh, fathers before him, St. Cyril, St. John Chrysostom, St. Gregory, and so on. So do you want to uh, yeah. read? Let me just point out real quick for, for all the viewers. I'm going to read this section from St. Severus, but notice the citation. St. Severus of Antioch to Sergius the Monophysite. Tell that the explain showing... difference, Daniel. The explain the difference between Miophysite and Monophysite. A lot of people won't Absolutely. know the difference. Thank you, Sam. So this is where I was going. What does this show the viewer? We are accused of being Monophysites, but... If we're monophysites, look who we're arguing against. We're arguing against monophysites. Severus is writing against monophysites. Meaning what? Monophysites are the people who believe the divinity swallowed up the humanity. Like yes. there's, uh, mm. like uh, uh, there's the the humanity essentially is just like a phantom. Yes, right? Th like that's phantom because they arrived to one essence, which yeah, is what Sergius did. Sergius the monophysite. Yeah, Sergius said that there's one essence in Christ. Exactly. So, which we would never say. We never say there's one essence or one usia. Um, now, um, Severus, Severus is writing against him. Severus is a saint for us. So then if Severus is writing against the Monophysites, writing against the Eutychians, writing against the Julianists, writing against the Nestorians, against the Chalcedonians, that means our position is not Monophysite. Obviously. And yes, Tony, he is. He's Tagit Surai, we call him, the crown of the of the Assyrians. Okay. For there is one who acts, that is, the word of God incarnate. And there is one active movement, which is activity. But the things which are done are diverse. That is, the things accomplished by activity. For example. Can I, can I but just I like add something? To this. Uh, so this is the thing I explained before. So if you go back to the soul analogy. So... This is the the nature, right? Let's say the word incarnate. Or actually, the next slide, I think. No, here. So this is the one incarnate nature. This is the one acting. And this is active movement. So this is one. 
And then you have the things being performed, the things being done. And then you have the explanation of saint service. You can uh, go ahead, somebody can. Bodily to walk on the earth and to make a journey is something human. But to raise up an order to run those who are lame in the feet and unable to use their souls, but who are prostrate and crawl like reptiles, is most proper to God. But there is one word which is incarnate and one activity of his, which is an active movement which performed the one and the other. And it is not the case that because these things which were done were of different kinds, we say that consequently there were two natures which were affecting those things. For as we have said, a single God, the word incarnate, performed both of them. And just as no one divides the word from the flesh, so also it is impossible to divide or separate these activities. Now, I mean, I want to appreciate that quotation. This is like gold, what you're getting for free. And praise God for these young men to take time to teach you. So you see what's saying? When Jesus walked the earth, that's a human function, but we do not say Jesus as man walked. It's God, the word, who is walking talking, eating, and drinking, but obviously it's because he is now taken on that human nature where he can do those things, but we don't divide the natures and speak of one nature doing it. It's that one unified <clears throat> eternal word who's walking, talking, eating, and we don't divide the natures and separate the activities and attribute one activity to one nature. You understand? This is what they were teaching before the schism. And all, I'm well, even the Catholics would believe this. So, so anyway, but uh, Orthodox. But go ahead. Just wanna. Yeah. So wanna this is uh, again. This is after the schism. But uh, uh, we like. I'm citing Saint Severus again. He is just a uh, uh, Oriental Orthodox saint, just to show that he's echoing and, be, and being in line with with the fathers before him. How the soul acts through the body, and how the word acts through his body and soul, is the same concept here. Being yeah. being yeah taught. So uh, you have, yes, here, here's an ex a great example from, from St. Cyril, again, an orthodoxy to uh, Emperor St. Theodosius. So uh, do you want to read it again? Yeah. Okay. The word's nature took humanity to itself for sure, but he was not merely human. Instead, because of his own glory overshadowed the element that he assumed, the wow. word permanently preserved his divine transcendence without confusing it with the humanity. This is what the disciples had realized when they worshipped him with the words, truly you are the son of God. Even yeah. though they could see him walking around in a human body, in reality he was walking miraculously as God. This also answers an objection of Muslims to show you how stupid they are. Because they follow a pagan pedophile when they say, oh, so... Are you worshiping the flesh of Jesus, the human nature of Jesus? You understand this quote right here the, from St. Cyril? It's the disciples saw the man Jesus. And by the way, he's referring to Matthew 14, 22 to 33. This is taken from Matthew 14, 22 to 33, where our Lord walked on water. And then Peter said, if it's you, Lord, then command me to walk. And he did, but he took his eyes off. He sunk, and then he cried out, Lord, save me. And then when he got in the boat, they got on the shore, it says, they all worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So they are seeing a man walking on the water, but they realize this man is the God-man. So it's not the human flesh they're worshipping. They're worshipping him, who is the God-man, who is one that became flesh. So they're not saying, okay, hold on. Let's make sure it's not his human flesh worshipping. No, no, we're worshipping you, the God-man, because you are God in flesh. Yes, and ironically, so I heard uh, R.C. Sproul, Alam Hasele, he, he said, we don't worship the humanity of Christ. This blasphemous. How are you separating it? Yeah. Um, look, at what, look at what Severus, and sorry if I'm, I'm uh, going ahead, Majd, uh, tell me if you have the quote. I have it in front of me, but if you want to show yeah. it later, that's fine. Um, Severus, what he says about this exact passage that Sam is talking about, the walking on the water. This is the quote. I have it in front of me. I'm going to read it to you from Severus of Antioch. Yeah, I don't have it here. He says, listen, everybody. He says, how will anyone divide walking on the water? 
to run upon the sea is foreign to the human nature, but it is not proper to the divine nature to use bodily feet. Therefore, that action of the incarnate word to whom belongs at the same time divine character and human indivisibly. Now, you see, the guys, the comments, when you go slow and break it down, people are getting it. You see, that's why I'm saying do your audience a favor. Did Now, you see that quote again? Re quote it one more time because you see that these men were brilliant, but they spoke on such a level of depth that you need someone stupid like me to try to make it more for us. But anyway, go ahead. Read it one more time. Look what he says. How will anyone divide walking on the water? To run upon the sea is foreign to the human nature. But it is not proper to the divine nature to use bodily feet. Wow, that's amazing. Therefore, that action is of the incarnate word to whom belongs at the same time divine character and human, indivisibly. Saint now, Severus. look how beautiful this statement is. In a nutshell, he's saying walking on water is a divine activity. But God doesn't have a physical body by nature to walk on water. So what's going on here? You have a man walking on water. That's a divine activity. But you need a body to walk on water. So what's going on here? The reason is we don't divide the natures. He is the God man. As God, he walks on water in that human body that he has. So the God man is walking on water because he has a physical body with feet. And because the divine word glory is in control of that <clears throat> That body, he's that body, but he's in control of it. And he's working through it. Like you were saying, the soul of man uses the body of man. The yes. God man walked on water because the God man can, as God, <clears throat> enable himself to walk on water in that physical body. The God man did it. Yes. See? Yeah. Uh, Praise God. And there is an interesting thing here because uh, notice how St. Cyril says the words nature, nature, not person took humanity to itself for sure. So the the nature of the word, again, we of course understand it as hypostasis, but it itself took the humanity. So it's not like he, two natures were united in one person, as the Kasdonians say. It's the word's nature took humanity to itself, not his person. That's not what he's saying. Yeah. It's not computer but here's a, like another passage showing that he used nature uh, uh, when speaking about hypostasis and how it's one nature out of two, because it is the word's nature which took on the human nature. Amazing. So again, uh, so this is like the whole like thing again. Uh, another diagram showing instead the incarnation of the word. And so here you have the composite being, as we saw before. That's like the human nature, the 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 flesh, animated with a rational soul. So it's flesh and soul together. And then you have the divine hypostasis or the divine nature, meaning the, the simple eternal word of the Father, right? They have their own worlds and energies, and they're not the same thing. And the personhood in this union is located in the word because the humanity has never existed outside of the union. And so it has never had its own personhood like there is no jesus of nazareth walking around first and then the word unites with him no that would this, be nestorianism yes or actually adoptionism yeah uh, even both instead, yeah. well yeah, it is nestorianism yeah, is adoptionism yes. yeah that's what it's both yeah so the human person united to a divine person and that's not the teaching of scripture in the early church go ahead exactly so the human nature has never had its own personhood in the union so that's why it hasn't like it has no, nothing inside of it here you have the word that's the personhood and then you have the hypostasis or nature of the word both of them are composed into this one incarnate nature which is composed of can you see when i zoom in yes okay so it's made of body soul and the word these three together are one incarnate nature and so christ acts always Theandrically, meaning divine human. Or as God God man. Man. Yes, the as God, God. Man. Yeah. Same thing with energy. And so again, as St. Cyrus explains, the things being performed, being done, are different. For instance, contemplating, praying, and dreaming belong to the soul, the yellow. Meaning, Meanwhile, 
the green eating sleeping and walking belong to the body and and the the um, healing miracles governing the universe and so on they all belong to the word divinity but they are all performed by this one incarnate nature even though the things being performed are different it's still done by this one being which is composed of word soul and body or word and humanity let me let me break it down before we get any further i sure. uh, just want because yeah people are getting it see when they get it they feel happy and elated see so people are getting like here this eugenia said i'm 50 years old and i'm starting to understand the trinity okay now notice he said when the word assumed human nature took to himself human nature he did not assume a human person now this is very important to understand typically if you're human you're a human person Jesus was not a human person. Understand what he's telling you. He's the only one who is human, but not a human person. All humans are human persons. I'm a human person. The word, when he took on a human nature, assumed a human nature, did not assume a human person or personality or personhood, because that would make him two persons, and that's the heresy of Nestorianism. Nestorianism teaches... There are two persons, a divine person and a human person. That's blasphemy. So the word is one parsopa, that's the technical term, person, who took and assumed a human nature and does all things <clears throat> as the God-man, God in flesh, after the incarnation. So you understand what he's saying here? So although there are certain energies, or you can say activities, my energy means actions, that he could only do because he's human, like eating. If he didn't become man, he wouldn't eat. If he didn't become man, he wouldn't sleep. Even though these are human activities, we don't divide the activities and ascribe them to two natures. We ascribe them to the same person. Jesus, the God-man, ate. This is what they're hammering to you. I hope you're getting it. I hope it's clear. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, do you want to add something, Brother Dior Scott, so like Subject and Daniel, before I move No, on? I mean, you covered it perfectly. Um if, I don't know if today we're going to continue with my presentation or if we need well, to set 50 up minutes one. for this one, 50 minutes, and then you're going to do another session this week. Godwin. If you can't do Friday, maybe you can do Saturday if you guys are open Saturday. We can, we can, we can so, actually do like, If you want, Brother Dioscorus, you can do yours now because the next like uh, part of my presentation is the uh, model of composition with soul and body. Like We can take that maybe next time. Sure. Um, and just for, I guess, a, sorry, I have to find out how to... I need to upload the presentation. Uh, just for basically like what to expect on um, Friday. So I can should be back to present a very important presentation on Leo of Rome. And I think... <laughs> people are going to find it very fascinating to say the least because it's going to be do that when you do that world war 3 <laughs> world war 3 <laughs> <Punch! Indeed>. shots <laughs> fired <laughs> when we do whenever the next presentation is when we do it on leo the whole thing's going to be on leo next time so right uh, fire we want we want the viewers to remember sam's reaction when he saw the theodore of mopswestia quote and remember to think, okay, why was Sam upset about Theodore? And what is Leo saying? We want that in the mind of the viewer. Now, before you move on, though, don't react to these sessions, please. Why? Because remember what I said, Catholics and or Eastern Orthodox are coming on next year, if the Lord wills, unless I'm in jail and C block for taxes. We'll see. I'll do a live stream from uh, federal prison. So what you hear, if you don't like, you don't start manifesting because when the catholics come other groups are not going to like what they hear or these are be patient hear them out and then you know you'll all have all the data to make an informed opinion so if they say anything about pope leo you don't like don't say heretic anathema take it easy take it easy because we're doing a show in january god willing but go ahead um okay this is visible okay perfect so I'm just going to skim over the ones that we've already covered, but I want to reiterate from last time to the listener, please take as many screenshots as you would like and as you would find helpful so that you can 
reference them even after the stream and distribute to those who you think would find these uh, slides helpful because they're made specifically for you. And so you don't have to just use them while watching the stream. So we already saw that in the first homily of St. Theodotus of Enchira, which is part of the Acts of the Council of Ephesus, he affirms that the union is of two, but that that two-ness, which the union is of, is no longer two after the union. He says it many times, and he says that it becomes a single one of that category that was of two. And oh, here is, yeah, this one. Here's a more of the continuation of the last slide. This is still part of the first homily. He explicitly says that there were not two things or two natures when likening the Egyptian river that became blood to the incarnational union of divinity and humanity. And he says, here's the third and final slide of the first homily, that the Nestorians divide Christ by recollecting the natures that united, saying that they remain two. So then how can these be one? Well, he says that it's only by a mere rationalization that they affirm oneness. And so basically, and he talks about this in his other writing, St. Theodore, what he's getting at is they just say that the name of Christ and the name of his person is one, but they believe that two natures are signified by that name. Now, well, before you move on, so are they saying because they say they're two natures, then that what they liken out, they have two persons? Yeah, and in fact, Saint, so Saint Theodotus of Enchira has, we'll, we'll be going over many of the works that are preserved by him, but there's one that's not even published in the original manuscript language, but there is a commentary on it. And this work is called Three Books Against Nestorius. And in these three books against Nestorius, Saint Theodotus of Enchira argues that if you, Nestorius, say that the name Christ is indicative of two natures, of the two natures which united, then you'll be found professing three Christs because you'll have three permutations, and we'll get into that, that are each equally called Christ yet distinct from each other in terms of being distinct Christs. And so if there's one name Christ for two natures, you'll be confessing that the divine nature alone is Christ since it has that name Christ. The human nature alone considered in itself is Christ and then yet the third permutation is the two, the set of the two of them together are yet a third Christ. Let me break down what the objection against Nestorius is. Guys, understand the objection. The objection against Nestorius is you end up with three Christs. Why? Because if you're saying two natures, then you're going to have to end up with two persons. Uh, if you don't say it's one composite nature, so you have two persons. Because if you are a divine, you have a divine nature, you're a divine knoma, you have to have a parsopa, person. If you have a human nature, you have a human knoma, then you're a human person. Unless you believe now the natures are unified in one, but you don't believe that you're saying two natures. So now you have three Christs, the divine Christ, the human Christ, and the incarnate Christ, when the two natures are united. So you see in Astorius? You are really confused. So you understand what the objection is against the stories, everyone? Focus, guys, Marina, no engaging each other. I'm going to have to send Fadid to find a place to sleep. Okay, everyone got it? The objection against the story is if you say there are two natures, you're going to now have three Christs. Why? Because to say two natures instead of saying one composite nature after the union, divine nature a divine gnoma, an example of that divine nature, and a divine person, that's one. Human nature, human gnoma, meaning he's a specific example, instance of human nature, and therefore a human person. And then the incarnate Christ, that's three. You're in Now, he's not saying this is what Nestorius is saying. What he's doing is saying, Nestorius, this is the conclusion of your system. If you're going to be consistent and you're going to take what you believe to its conclusion, you end up with three Christ, even though you deny it. So I hope you understood the objection. Go ahead. Thank you for that, Sam. Um, I'd also like to point out with regards to this slide that notice how he keeps saying that even though this union, which we've already seen, he says is of two, 
You can't say that there are two. You can't speak of Christ as twofold. You can only admit a single one after that union. Now, all of this language of rationalizing two, yet even if you try to profess one, that that's still illegitimate, this argumentation, it looks as if it could have come from St. Severus himself, because one of the, basically the central polemic that the Chalcedonians threw at St. Severus was his explanation of how a, a duality after the union is necessarily and by definition division, that duality will bring division. Well, that's exactly what the Council of Ephesus is saying here. And so technically St. Severus didn't need to say it. He could have just quoted St. Theodotus, but uh, in his excellence, he explained it to the Chalcedonians of his day. And they were never actually able to refute him, as we'll see way down the down the line. And again, guys, uh, everything everything Dioscoros is showing here, this is at the Council of Ephesus 431. This right. is a council that is recognized by Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic. So at that already... council, at that council, they're saying, do not speak of two distinct natures because you're going to end up dividing them and end up with two persons. Speak of one composite nature. Is that what it was? Correct. Right. And hmm. they'll even explain in, in more depth how that is the reductio of two natures after the union, what it reduces to. Uh, by the way, these homilies of St. Theodotus, the only way they are preserved to our day in their entirety is due to the Council of Ephesus. So it's a literal collection of writings called the Acts of Ephesus. And you might find one in Europe in some library. You might find another one preserved in another library in, you know, Africa, whatever. It's via these collections of the copies of the Acts of the Council of Ephesus that these very homilies are preserved. So it's not just that they're included in the Council of Ephesus, but that's the only way we even have them because they originated at Ephesus. And so that's and, how important uh, they are. Yeah, it's um, it, the, the edition we're using uh, the, for, if someone wants to read the Acts of Ephesus, the Acts of Chalcedon, Father Richard Price, who was actually a Roman Catholic, he's the one um, who's been working on all of now, this. Now, Price, his translation of Ephesus, it, he doesn't include the translations of these homilies or of various other stuff in the Acts of Ephesus, not just St. Theodotus homilies. But he does talk about them in footnotes, and in his bibliography, he cites Frankel's Studia Patristica entry thing, in the appendix of which she, Frankel, translated these homilies. We're using her translations, which are very literalistic to the Greek, very word for word. Um, yeah, so in this second... This is, sorry, Dioscoros. This is where I've been saying for years. I've been I've been doing this stuff with the, with the online people since uh, early 2019, and for years I've been telling everybody, please read your councils, read your councils, read Chalcedon, read Ephesus, read the letters of Cyril against Theodora and back and back and forth, so you understand what he means by one nature. Who's better interpreting Cyril than Cyril? Who's better interpreting Cyril than his hand-picked successor and the same synod of bishops that his successor inherited from him? Did, right. the, did the synod of Cyril, which was the same synod of bishops in Alexandria that continued to Ephesus, it's not like they all died with him. It's the same synod of bishops. How come the synod of Cyril did not accept Chalcedon? Yeah, so, precisely. So, uh, Please, guys, read your councils. This is it not all just philosophy. It's not about using big words and acting smart. And read by the way, counsel. all three of these people that this that I'm presenting from, Saints Theodotus, Cyril, and Akakius, they were not mere bishops at Ephesus. They were the presiding bishops who became saints at Ephesus. So these three are not only the ones who were the bishops who were overseeing the council they are canonized as saints yes uh, now saint theodotus and saint cyril are explicitly canonized and then saint akakius is by inference canonized because we venerate those fathers we venerate all of the fathers of ephesus who 
kept that faith and didn't basically apostatize okay. this in the story. And it's, so it's like so saying the can, 318 of Nicaea, like that. that's it's exactly like that. Well, now, just to just so people understand, these three presiding bishops, who were the ones who were overseeing the Council of Ephesus, who made these statements, speak of one composite nature. Don't speak of two. Not that he doesn't have two, but the two become one, and we don't divide them, lest you end up with heresy. These are even authorities respected and loved and recognized by the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox? Correct. Right. Okay. Uh, at least St. Theodotus and St. Cyril. Uh, with St. Akakius, the Eastern Orthodox writers don't really talk about him as much as the other two. Historically, but they don't consider him a heretic. That's what I didn't say. Can state they don't say he's a heretic, right? No, no, they still canonize him. Right. Even I, oh, I think okay. I've only seen one Roman Catholic source that said that St. Akakius repented of Monophysitism, <laughs> but I think it was kind of like a an inferential supposition that the writer. Yeah, but had. he wasn't. He wasn't a Monophysite, so say okay, we accept that. Because monophysit yeah. monophysitism is not meophysitism, but not to confuse people. So people understand what I'm getting at. Understand what they're telling you. This is, they're giving you sources, and that means when the Catholic come, they have to address these claims. And the Eastern Orthodox have to address these claims. These are claims they all have to address. So here's what's being said to everyone. These right. three are accepted as legitimate Orthodox bishops defending and affirming the true faith of the church true christology so what they're telling you is these three said you must no longer speak of two after the union when christ became flesh the two natures are now one composite nature inseparably unified in one person no longer speak of two so if these are bishops accepted and loved and revered by Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholic, not just Oriental Orthodox, they're basically saying, you guys have a problem. That's what right. they're saying. Okay, but go ahead. So, and so, um, this hold, slide here. Hold on, hold on, Gil oh, yeah. I just, I want to say too, uh, these, these writings, you guys, they are interpreted in their context. So I don't read, let's say, Bodius, in the ninth century, whenever he was, or John of Damascus, Maximus, and I'm reading them onto this, and then trying to mold this to fit them, the later guys. It don't work. That's the opposite. Do the later guys agree with the earlier stuff? Yeah, that's right. that's the measurement. The, the 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 standard, the rule, is what we. Let me give them a very good example so they understand. You don't go to James White to tell you what Ignatius meant about the Eucharist, because James White is biased. James White is a five-point Calvinist. James White cannot let Ignatius affirm that the Eucharist is the flesh of Christ because it will bury him. So what he's saying to you is don't go to later sources trying to explain these statements. Go to the very writings, read these men in their own words, and see what they said. Yeah. So I hope that was a good an analogy. Yes, thank you. Sir. Oh, that was, that was perfect. And... Um... And this one, which we also, this is the last one we had already covered. So all the next slides are going to be new. So if, if people are uh, tired about, you know, the old slides being presented, this is the last one. So with this one, he explicitly says in the Council of Ephesus that the uh, Jews did not crucify a mere man, nor did they nail the visible nature only. What did they nail then? The united nature. Just like when the emperor writes down his word which his word is not physical, it vanishes into thin air, the nature of his word, you could say. Uh, but he writes it down onto a physical papyrus. And so when someone like a rebel tears that up, the reason he's put to death by the emperor isn't because he tore just the visible nature of the papyrus, but because he tore the united nature of the word that was en papyrus, <laughs> to use like a... Yeah, a, a neologism. But, um, yeah, so that's the important part of homily, too. You, with you guys homily understand the analogy? If I take a piece of paper with words on it and I destroy the paper, it's not just the paper I'm destroying or the words. 
I'm destroying both the words and the paper because they're inseparable. So when you nail Jesus on the cross, it's not just the man who's being nailed, nor even the God <clears throat> nature. It is that one person who is the God man that's being nailed. The God man was crucified. Go ahead. Okay, we got it. Now right. let's and for this to be that side. one person. It's therefore one united nature and not two natures. Um, cool. So as it regards the third homily in the Acts of the Council of Ephesus by St. Theodotus of Ancyra, we see he says he starts to get into this important topic of what the name is and then what are you referring to by the name you can't be referring to two things by the name two natures even though christ is of two natures so where is he who divides the christ where is he who does equivocality to our mystery equivocality ca equivocality meaning that you are calling them equally and on the one hand says that christ is one but on the other hand he supposes two one the slave and the other the Lord, one the suffering, the other the, the other the not suffering. So he says, what is the benefit of one single, even a single appellation, that appellation being Christ, let's say, while positing two things? But wait, Christ is composed of two things, isn't he? Well, so then the two things can't remain two things after their union. They have to now be one composite thing. And he gets into this in greater detail in his exposition on the creed of Nicaea or exposition on the Nicene creed. This was a, um, it, it's more lengthy than his homilies. It was something that he wrote to basically the emperor St. Theodosius II, who was the emperor who uh, presided over Ephesus I and Ephesus II and refused to overturn Ephesus II when Rome and uh, others wanted him to overturn it. Because he said, no, this is the faith of our church. We're just reiterating the faith of Ephesus. And the Melkites, they still venerate him to this day. Even though this council that they reject, Ephesus II, he supported. No doubt thanks to St. Theodotus of Ancyra teaching him the Orthodox Christology. So, St. Theodotus of Ancyra says in section 7 of this work, and he's referring, by the way, to Ephesians 4.10, mm -hmm. when Christ he is well. speaking about what St. Paul teaches. So listen to this from a biblical mindset. He says, you will not ascend to God, O man, unless you confess the descent of God. Paul says, one is he who descended and he who ascended, not one and another, but the same is no longer divided, no longer considered two after the union. For he who ascended, he says, is also he who ascended above men, so that he might fill all things. The things once contemplated two, the economy made one. Mm. So then, no longer say two after the indissoluble union. What grace united, let thought not divide. So Plain as day, guys. Do you really see that? Plain as day. Yeah. Do you think it can get any clearer than this, Sam? No, no. I'm saying, so you guys clearly see it's plain as day, right? The Theodotus plain. is basically saying, do not speak of two anymore after the incarnation. Not because there aren't two natures. We don't divide them because they're perfectly unified in the one person. So let's speak of the one nature. And the analogy where it's given, like man and woman become one flesh, no longer say they're two. So there it is, plain as day. It's right there. Keep going. Thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, so exactly. It can't get any clearer than this. No, Because he says that they were once con contemplated too. And the word, by the way, that he uses for contemplation there is a form of theoria, which becomes an important Greek word when we look at the writings of St. Cyril. And uh, thought, he's using a form of epinoia, which is a totally different word, which will be utilized in different contexts by different church fathers. Um, but uh, that's an important thing I just wanted to note there. Yeah. So but, yeah. it can't get I, any clearer. Brother, let me real quickly. Louis, my brother, my brother from a different mother. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Uh, do not misapply Second Corinthians chapter 4.
verses 14 and 16. That was not Paul's point. You took a passage to teach correct doctrine, but the passage that you use is applied incorrectly. That's not Paul's point in 2 Corinthians. If you read the context, he's saying, we do not view Christ from a worldly perspective. Because in the theology of Paul, flesh means corrupt, carnal, worldly thinking, soulish, sinful, corrupted <clears throat> thinking. So he's saying, we do not see Christ the way the fallen, corrupt world sees Christ, someone who is killed and buried, because we know he's glorified and exalted. So, Lewis, help us to help you by not helping us. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. And the next section that I wanted to present, there's going to be more from that work that we just looked at from St. Theodotus, but that's going to be after some other stuff that I want to touch from St. Cyril. Um, and St. Cyril, by the way, just like St. Theodotus that we saw earlier in the first slide, they both teach that Christ's nature is single. Single means that it is one and not two. It's not the same, even though it's spelled similar to simple. Simple means it isn't composed of uh, multiple things. We, you, you can have a singularity like a single human nature, which is composed of two things, but it's not two things. It's one thing of the two. Now, the third letter of St. Cyril to Nestorius. This is also part of the Acts of the Council of Ephesus, and I would go so far as to argue that it was the principal document of Christology that was accepted at the Council of Ephesus. It's what the Council of Ephesus revolved around. In the order 12 anathemas? To... Yes, the 12 Absolutely. anathemas. So again, for, for the viewer, the 12 anathemas of Cyril from his third letter to Nestorius, at Ephesus 431, they were read into the minutes. The 12 anathemas are equal with the Creed of Nicaea. Just like the creed is non-negotiable, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the 12 anathemas of Cyril are non-negotiable, inspired by the Holy Spirit. That is the That's point of Ephesus 4.31. That's the dogma. Explain to those who don't know how the ancient churches view ecumenical councils where all the churches were one, not after the schism, because you have Protestants who only think scriptures are inspired. What do you mean they are inspired? Absolutely. You guys, uh, for the... For the protestants and evangelicals out there you believe that the canon of scripture the list of the canon of scripture is inspired by the holy spirit who told you that where does that idea come from what is the canon what does it mean to be inspired by the holy spirit under what authority are you saying our table of contents is inspired by the holy spirit has there ever been an ecumenical council that gave us the canon of scripture no, there hasn't. So this is divine tradition that has been passed down that we believe, just like we have canons for the fast, canons for the priesthood, canons for this, we also have canons of that which was read during the lectionary in the liturgy. That's what we know what the canon of scripture is. It's the same tradition that gives it to us. Now, what did, what did the councils deal with? when If they didn't deal with the canon of scripture, look how not... Um, uh, non-controversial the canon of scripture was that they didn't even deal with it at an ecumenical council they dealt with uh, the divinity of Christ and the Trinity at Nicaea, Constantinople and Ephesus and here we have dogmatic definitions the, the faith that was put forth by the council that was led by the Holy Spirit to preserve the faith passed down once for all to the saints like Jude 3 says and like Paul says in Galatians 1, 8, and 9, if I or an angel from heaven brings to you any other faith, he is accursed. We sing that, by the way. We chant it every week in the Syrian Orthodox liturgy. We chant Galatians 1, 8, and 9. Every and liturgy. And the here means anathema. It's yeah. the word anathema. And so when we speak about the 12 anathemas, it's the same word. So now, in this uh, ecclesiastical faith and, and context and belief if you are a christian the the definition of the word christian like let's say for example if you have a webster's dictionary or something what the definition should be christian next to it should be we believe in one god the father almighty etc etc the, the creed of nicaea that you cannot say you're a christian if you do not believe in the creed 
period. And the 12 anathemas of St. Cyril from Ephesus are attached. You can't be orthodox if you don't believe in the 12 anathemas of Cyril. This is essential. It's not an option. Right. Now, um, does that answer the question, part- Sam? For the people, you think yeah. Now that uh, so that the Protestants understand, inspiration also will extend to the church coming together as a unified whole, guided and guarded by the Spirit, not to agree on false, damnable teaching. So the Holy Spirit guarantees that when the church is together as a unified whole in this ecumenical council, they will be guided by the Spirit to never decide on error and blasphemy. Otherwise, the church fails. And that would mean Jesus failed, which would be blasphemy. But go ahead. And and just to, to reiterate Sam's point for any Protestant objector, uh, again, you have to prove to us why your canon of Scripture, the list of books, why it's infallible. Why are you, is there, how do you know what Scripture is without this, what we're telling you? Know, yeah. For you to believe what Scripture is, you have to believe that the Holy Spirit is inspiring something outside of right. Scripture yes. to know what Scripture is. And by the way, brother, just so people understand how bad it is in Protestantism, when I used to be a staunch Reformed Calvinist, I would read books from Calvinists on Sola Scriptura. Mm. They will tell you, the late R.C. Sproul, now guys, I want you to hear this, that our canon, canon, you know, the, the books of the Bible, he said, is a fallible list of infallible books, meaning wow. the canon is not an inspired revelation. It's simply men who, without being guided by the Spirit or inspired by the Spirit, collected these books that are infallible. So when you go that route, when you say you have a fallible list of infallible books, then the door opens for the possibility to then re-examine and review whether this fallible list made a mistake in accepting a book that shouldn't be there. That is the Protestant position. See, this is the Protestant position. You ask Protestants who are scholars, I'm not lying, is the list of inspired books an infallible list that were the spirit guided so that we know this is infallible, they'll say no. It was uninspired men who <clears throat> we do believe in some, some way God guided them, but it wasn't an infallible list or inspired list because these men were not inspired, could be mistaken. So doesn't that, in theory, open up the door to the possibility that they chose some wrong books? And they'll tell you, yes, they have to if they're consistent. But go ahead. And and I just want to, last thing I want to say about this. Um, in Oriental Orthodoxy, Coptic, Syriac, Armenian, Tewahedo, we have different canons of Scripture. We don't have the same canon of Scripture. And we are all in communion, and it never it's not even an issue. You know why? Because the early apostolic primitive church had different canons of Scripture, and nobody had a council to figure out, well, what is it? Why? Because we have a lectionary. The lectionary is the story of salvation over the year leading up to the resurrection. That's the point of a canon. Canon means the rules. We have canons about different things, priesthood, fasting. We have different canons. So the canon particular to an area is a canon of rule for the the people of that community. It's not an indication of inspiration. Canonicity does not equal inspired. uh, The Coptic church has revelation. My ancestors, the Surai, we don't have revelation as canon. Do we accept that it's inspired? Of course. The Copts have it. We don't have it as canon, but we can still accept it as inspired. Do you understand? The canon is up to the community to bind and loose. Yeah. Let me let me correct Lewis again. Lewis, that's not the argument of the Protestants. The Protestants say your books are inspired. Your 66 Protestant books are inspired. That wasn't the argument. That's why, Lewis, I love you, my friend. Strike two, Lewis, and I love you, man. Please hang in there. I don't want to be strike three. Second mistake. Let me repeat again. They'll tell you your 66 books. They're all inspired by the Holy Spirit. They're infallible and inerrant, without error. Those are the Protestants who do believe in inspiration. 
what they'll tell you is these books, when they were gathered, because these books did not come down from heaven in one volume, the church gathered them. They'll say, well, that act of gathering them, that wasn't inspired. So that because it's not an inspired act of the church gathering those books, it's fallible. It's human. And therefore, in theory, because they were not inspired or guided by the Spirit infallibly, like the ancient churches would believe in an ecumenical council, that means in theory, there's a potential they chose a wrong book. That's exactly what Martin Luther believed. If you read Martin Luther, I'm not lying, Google it. We did sessions on it. Martin Luther thought that James should not have been in the New Testament. Hebrews should not have been in the New Testament, even Revelation. And because the Deuterocanonicals gave him a hard time, he rejected them. So Martin Luther is an example of what I'm saying. Don't take my word for it. Google Martin Luther, canon, his view of James, Hebrews, Revelation, and the Deuterocanonicals. Yeah, I'm not lying. Google it. We did sessions where we quote the man from his own writings. This is something even Protestants admit. But go ahead. Thank you. So to continue upon this third letter, what is this third letter? Well, let's see what it teaches because this is St. Cyril's, um, well, I mean, it's in the name. It's the third letter to Nestorius. He wrote a first, a second, and then this third one is the one that happens kind of like a little bit before Ephesus and then Ephesus is centered around this letter. So he says that Christ being made one according to person, name, what is it? Well, no, actually he says being made one according to nature, kata fusim, and not converted into flesh. He made his indwelling in such a way as we may say that the soul of man does in his own body. Look at that. He's comparing it to the soul and the body composing the one and single nature of a man. Neither, he says, do we understand the manner of conjunction to be opposition, like putting two things next to each other. They're next to each other. They juxtapose or oppositioned. Why? For this does not suffice for personal oneness, for a oneness of son, for a oneness of Christ. He says specifically, the reason this does not suffice is because it does not suffice for natural oneness. Natural oneness is what must be confessed according to Ephesus. This isn't what the Chalcedonians hold though. He says, he continues, the one and only Christ. Wait, so we know he needs to be naturally one. So then does that mean we can say he's twofold according to some category? Well, no, he says the one and only Christ is not twofold, even though he is understood as compounded out of two. Think about that. Hmm. Out of two is what we've been saying all along. And the Chalcedonians teach that Christ is in two after the union, just as he is of two, that the two-ness, which he is out of, remains two in the same way after the union. But St. Cyril is rejecting this as heretical. He says that Christ isn't twofold, even though we understand him as out of two different elements in an indivisible union. Just as a man is understood as consisting of soul and body. So is man twofold? But yet is not twofold. So he's not twofold, but is rather one from out of both. Now, this is very interesting that we see this position dogmatized that completely rejects everything diophysitism stands for because there is a, uh, a really nice um, Chalcedonian fellow who was basically saying, and this was not big news, but it was addressed in one of our Lion's Den streams, <clears throat> that when pressed with the fact that Christ being united out of two natures, well, so is the nature of the human nature, which he composed with himself. It's one nature out of two natures. And so since the fathers say that a man is one nature out of two natures, mustn't Christ also be one nature out of two natures? 
And the response of this Chalcedonian individual, who knows a lot, by the way, he's a very smart guy, very well read. He said, well, no, because the nature of a man is a tertium quid, which is just a fancy Latin word. It just means that he is a confused mixture, according to this guy. But that's not true, because we still distinguish what is proper to the soul and what is proper to the body, even when we don't enumerate two men or two human natures. There is one nature of a man, just as there's one and only nature of Christ from the two. Hmm. So we see the, the 12 anathemas are great. But I just wanted on this slide to focus on one, which is the fifth anathema. St. So, Cyril says... Mm, go ahead, finish it. Finish the fifth one. because um, then So people has, understand what you're getting at. Go ahead. Keep in mind that these condemnations are dogmatic for anyone who claims to hold to Ephesus, which even includes a lot of confessional Protestants, believe it or not, like your Reformed tradition, your Lutheran tradition, whatever. If anyone dares to say that Christ was a God-bearing man, and not rather God in truth, being by nature one son, even as the word became flesh and is made partaker of blood and flesh precisely as us, let him be anathema. And so we see clearly here that the being one son is by nature. And the, the oneness of nature is what makes the son one. And we'll see later on, St. Cyril talks about this in more depth, that the reason the son is one son, even after the union and not two sons, is because he's one nature out of the two natures. Mm. So that, uh, like, how do you escape that? If so you're, you're saying these anathemas by St. Cyril, mm. these anathemas, he's basically saying, because this is what the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox are going to have to deal with, obviously. He's basically saying after the union, after Christ has become incarnate, though he has two natures, divine human, they are now one composite nature. You don't speak of them as two. And if you start speaking of them of two, you can be anathematized and should be anathematized, right? Exactly. exactly. And that brings us to our next slide, which is very, very important. Remember that third guy, St. Akakius? Well, he wrote a very important letter. He wrote only a few letters. He has a very small corpus which is preserved, but this is by far his most important writing. He also has, by the way, a homily at Ephesus, which is part of the Acts of Ephesus, which is a nice thing to note. But this letter that he wrote to St. Cyril of Alexandria and St. Cyril responded to, this is perhaps the most important part of this presentation because it involves two of the presiding bishops speaking with each other and agreeing mutually on the heart of the Diophysite era, error, that it is the center of what makes Nestorianism heretical. So, St. Akakius wrote to St. Cyril in 433 to inquire as to basically what was happening with something called a, the formula of reunion. It was an event in history, and we'll see that various people uh, talk about it. And St. Cyril, he provides clarity on what is exactly meant by the formula of reunion and how on his terms it is to be interpreted. So St. Akakius writes to him to let everyone be forced to publicly anathematize the dogmas of Nestorius and Theodore. This is Theodore of Mopsuistia, by the way. That's like what Sam says. Right. Exactly yeah. like what Sam says. So then what, what are these dogmas of Nestorius and Theodore? Let's hear them. What are they? How do we know whether or not they're teaching those dogmas? Well, he says, especially. So keep this in the forefront of your mind. Those who say two natures after the union, properly each one working. For you, know those who says are, that? you know who says that? St. Cyril as well. Who, but who says two natures after the union properly, each one working? Oh, yeah. That, there was a pretty important document that speaks about that. That's going to be covered on Friday, by the way. So that's why you all want to not just take screenshots of this, but also hmm. get yourself seated for Friday's episode because that's going to be uh, huge. I think subdeacon means uh, Leo and, and Chalcedon, that they say. Right. And yes. just, just wrote something, uh, Sam. You remember when I said 
to nature's one nature we don't care about just the terms it's what's implied by them so yeah. like notice here he says he doesn't just say two natures two natures after the union this is the important part it's and not just properly like each one working exactly yeah. so we don't deny completely two natures right it's two natures after the union which is what the yeah. castonians confess and we'll see that saint akakius himself is implicitly accepting that christ is composed out of two natures even though you have to especially anathematize two natures after the union we'll see how he's getting at that a little bit later so he says that he found some in germanicea and they indeed refuse to say two sons okay that's cool but so does nestorius so whatever i guess but indeed <laughs> not refusing to say two natures now the impl implication here as the continuation of the same context is after the union and we'll see why so what he's saying here guys does anybody say whether it's chalcedonians like no, no, catholic assyrian church of the east does anybody say we believe in two persons or two sons no nobody, nobody says that so he's saying even if they're refusing to say two sons but not refusing to say two natures it's it's the same anathema here exactly and he even goes so far as to say that to do that and to say that each nature works by itself and this suffers and that remains impassive there is no other thing than to confess two sons again and and this is very important bring in the parts well what does that mean bring in the parts that means he's accepting that the natures are the parts but that if you bring them in after the union as two then you're making them into two sons and these nestorians who you know are supposed to have repented in 433 are going to be confessing two sons again by implication yeah let me let me hammer that point the the the, the argument here what you're saying is you may deny all day all night that there are not two sons you may deny that and you don't want to accept that but to be consistent this is the objection to be consistent you're going to end up with two sons because if you keep speaking of two natures and no longer one composite nature two natures is going to lead you down the path of two sons whether you like or not i know you don't want to believe that you don't want to say that but the conclusion if you're going to be consistent and you <clears throat> work out the logic of your position you're going to end up with two sons you don't want to say that but you're going to end up with two sons so this is the objection so they're saying now to be safe so you don't end up opening a door to heresy and lead people to that road of heresy stop saying two after the union yeah there are two natures but they're now unified in one person they're no longer two but one it's one composite nature now understand the implication of what they're getting at if you guys are not nestorian and you're not you're not a Syrian church of the east what they're telling you eastern orthodox i don't think you guys are picking up on this i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you what they're basically telling you in a very loving manner because they want to seek love and true communion based on truth they're not trying to demonize they're saying catholics eastern orthodox this argument applies to you because when you say two natures whether you like it or not if you're going to be consistent you know you end up with two sons so they're saying right. you too will be charged with nestorianism you hit the nail on the head yeah uh, but i don't I think give, I, I want to give the viewers an illustration of yeah. this so, but I wanted them to see you're saying that even the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox who affirm two natures, they will end up inevitably with the charge of Nestorianism, even though they reject it. That's what you're getting at. You want them to see right. that's what you're saying. And, right. And I want to give an example. So I was speaking to an Egyptian Chalcedonian um, not too long ago. Um, the conversation was in Arabic. And he's telling me it was the Son of God who wrote, raised the dead and did miracles and etc and it was the son of man who slept and ate like son of man and son of god that's two sons and he's like no no it's not two sons but you're talking about two sons i told him and then what did i say i used the example that we just read to you from saint Severus about the walking on the water with the feet and the divinity etc quiet couldn't answer a word after that because when you're saying the son of man does this and the son of God does this, there's two sons. One is a son of man, one is a son of God. That's two. 
two sons. His nature is here, hypostasis. Um, or yeah, yeah, the word in the, the, the hypostasis, one from two, as we kind of started to cover. But the nice thing about these slides that I'm presenting is that even though we are covering the metaphysics bit by bit. The word, the, so to answer the question, it's hypostasis. I don't yeah. know if you heard So it. the Greek words for nature here is hypostasis? Yes. Hypostasis, hypostasis, okay. The Greek word for nature there is physis, but the meaning, the usage is to mean the same thing as hypostasis. Just like is, yeah. if I say uh, two fruits, that is oranges. The fruits in this context, I'm speaking specifically about oranges. When I say the fruits, that is the oranges. And St. Sure. Cyril will use that um, sort of method. He'll say the natures, that is the hypostases or Christ's nature, that is his hypostasis. Okay, so um, just so people understand yeah. what you're saying, the words here in the Greek is phusis because I don't want to say feces because feces sounds, you know, like yeah. <laughs> phusis, right? But in Cyril's vocabulary, he's using phusis basically as synonymous with hypostasis because if you have a phusis, you have a hypostasis, right? Right. But it, and even more important, though, is that the meaning of the term whatever it means, he also affirms that the two which united are that same category. Exactly, Ortho, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Eastern Orthodoxy is not able to account for what the two parts or constituents or things that united, what they are, because they each must have what's called individual characteristics, mm -hmm. such as the brownness of the hair of the flesh he composed with himself, or the virgin born is uh is yeah. another individual characteristic let me, let me break yeah. down what your debates are because i the for the rest okay oriental orthodox syrian church of the east agree that if you have a nature you must have a hypostasis a kanuma but they do not mean person now let me explain this is where the eastern orthodox uh, are at odds with the oriental orthodox when the eastern orthodox uses the word Hypostasis or hypostasis. They mean it as the same as person. Let me do, let me play it out for these guys. Guys, bear with me because I want to understand why there's so much debate. Okay, okay. In Eastern Orthodoxy, the word hypostasis or hypostasis or hypostasis means the same thing as person. Okay. In Eastern Orthodox theology, when you say to Eastern Orthodox hypostasis, that means person. Not to the Oriental Orthodox or the Assyrian Church of the East. They don't define hypostasis, which in Syriac would be konoma, to mean person. They say, no, that's not what we mean. They mean an example of instantiation, right, of an Asher. Let me go through this, guys. Sorry about that instantiation. You guys, man, what you did to me, now I'm learning technical language. Anyway, so the Oriental Orthodox, these guys, Assyrian Church, say, no, hypostasis kruma does not mean, I didn't finish out to spell it out, does not mean person. That's not how we define the term. So they don't agree on definition of terms. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. They don't agree on the definitions. Eastern Orthodox will tell you, Hypostasis means person. They say no, it doesn't. Hypostasis, hypostasis, simply means an example of a nature. So I'm an example of human nature or an instantiation of a human nature. You guys understand the difference now? That's how they're defining it. Let me use that stupid analogy again. You ready? Sorry, guys. Let's help them out. You still got another 10 minutes because we start a little later. Okay, here. See? She now she got it. You see why I gotta go slow, guys? I want them to understand your theology. She goes, Oh, she's Sereta then. Huh? Yeah, she's Chaldean. They don't like to oh, be okay. called the Syrian, okay? They're Chaldean, sir. They don't like to be called the Syrian, even though we're one people, okay? Don't you ever bother my sister. All right, okay, here we go. Yeah, see now watch her. These are two kunume. Remember the example? <laughs> okay. The Oriental Orthodox who read Greek, they will say, these are two hypostases, but they're not person. These are two kunume hypostases 
of bottle. Let's say bottle is a nature. Here are two examples of the nature of bottle. Two examples. They're identical, by the way, because I use this for, you know, magnesium is good for your heart. If you're now, you know, want a little bit about my life. Two instantiations. That's a technical term. Two examples of the nature of bottle. So in their theology, the word, for example, of a particular nature is hypostasis. That's how they use the term. The Eastern Orthodox, they use the term hypostasi to mean person. See, I'm a person. So they're not using the same definition. For Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox, or the Eastern Orthodox, I could not say these two are two hypostases because they'll look at me and they'll think I'm stupid. No, they're not. They're not persons, idiot. You understand the point, guys? You understand the difference. If I say to an Eastern Orthodox, hey, these are two hypostases of the nature of bottle, they'll say, man, you're stupid, dude. They're not persons because they're taking the term hypostases to mean person. These guys, Oriental Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, Syrian Church of the East, they'll say, no, we're not using the term hypostases to mean person. So what term do they use for person? They go, for us, the word for person is prosopan in the Greek. Prosopan. Prosopan. Let me spell it out, man. You guys, man, are killing me, dude. For them, the Coptic, that theology is in Greek, it's the word prosopan. So they'll tell you these two are hypostases, but they don't have prosopan. This is not a prosopan. It's not a person. This is not a prosopan. It's not a person. But they're two hypostases. The Greeks say no. If it's a hypostasis, it's a person. Do you understand the debate now, guys? I hope I clarify before we move on. Do you understand the debate? They're not using the word with the same definition. They're not defining the term the same way. So then in reality is, who do you agree with? And who do you think has the right definition? Everyone got it now? So I can and, let them finish? And just one thing. The most important question is, how did the fathers define these terms? Yes. Yes. Right, right. Exactly. And that's why it med his presentation has been so lovely. And he's going to have more to present, by the way. Um, now, with this letter 40 of St. Cyril to Alexandria, uh, of Alexandria to St. Akakius, this is the response letter to that very letter. So some Chalcedonians might be thinking, okay, St. Akakius obviously says that, um, that the two things, whatever metaphysical category you want to call them, whatever those are, those two stop being two of that category. So he obviously disagrees with us. Well, maybe he was just a monophysite and heretical or something. Maybe that's what they would say. Well, the problem is that St. Cyril responded. And in the opening of this letter, he says that he was delighted exceedingly at this letter that he received from St. Akakius and that he wanted to uh, address one another with this letter because it is a sweet things for brothers to do. So they're brothers and that they are both of truly sound thinking. So we see that he accepts the letter as completely orthodox and even moreover, he expounds even more on how anti-diophysite he, St. Cyril, is in agreement with St. Akakius. So what St. Cyril says is he says in this way, when we have the idea of the elements of the one and unique Son and Lord, Jesus Christ, we speak of two natures being united, but after the union, the duality stays there? There's still two? No. The duality has been abolished. Abolished. That means Wait, there's no so more duality. Saint Cyril, right? And this is something that Saint Dioscorus. 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 Yeah. Sam's asking you. This is he Saint said, Cyril of Alexandria, right? Yes, sir. This is Saint Cyril of Alexandria okay. responding and approving Saint Acacius. Let me let me hammer it. Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholics, you're gonna have to address these citations for the benefit of all of us. Saint Cyril is saying. After Jesus becomes flesh, the duality, the two natures, have been abolished, meaning you don't speak of two anymore. No more two. So then finish it. And 
we believe the son's nature to be one. Wow. That is the part that St. Akakius did not bother including. He didn't have to include it. It was implicit that the son's nature is one after the union. It's implied, but he doesn't explicitly say it. What St. Cyril is doing here is he's making sure to hammer home the point, by the way, that means there must be one nature after the union, since there aren't two anymore. Hmm. So why? Since he is one son. So the way for the son to be one is for his nature to be one, which happens because the duality is abolished. What duality? The duality of the two natures which united. Do you see that, Chalcedonians? Do you see how contrary this is to everything that Chalcedonianism stands for? Joe Yonan, if you're upset, why don't you go to Nineveh, go to Kirkuk, or go to, you know, and cry me a river at the Euphrates River. Get the ladder, dude. Anyway, for the rest of you, see why I say going slow and defining your terms. Kiri Leysun's my mod, her husband gave his life to Jesus Christ. He's ethnically Jewish, but he worships and loves the triune God and they're Eastern Orthodox. So now see, she's appreciating because look what she said. This stream is appreciated because I don't think we were ever properly taught the Oriental Orthodox position and it's often misunderstood, you see? So what you're going to do at the end of the day, if you don't demonize each other, you're going to create greater understanding and then the other side will be less hostile less antagonistic and they will hesitate to demonize the demonize the other side so at the end of the day you know what this is doing it's showing you man these guys are not demons after all they're not of the devil after all man they're so demonized that i thought they were heretics from the pit of hell now you've created an environment where they can love one another and appreciate one another not demonize one another and that was the purpose even if you disagree but Go ahead, brother. You got a couple of minutes to wrap up for this part. Sure. I can maybe get to one other slide if yes. that's... Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. So this is a very important letter. This is St. Cyril's second letter to Sassensus. It would be good for us to sometime cover all four... Before you go on, brother. brother mm -hmm. Just we can. Vesmer, this is what I would do, what I call causing me to want to hang myself with my shoestrings and throw myself off the first floor window. How can you say two natures before the union? Because Christ did not have two natures before the union. See, I'm about to smash my head against the kitchen window or the first floor. There was no two natures before, before Christ became flesh. He only had one nature. He was divine. What two natures before the union? A lot of snack bar, a lot of snack bar. Go ahead, brother. Um, and one remedy to that is to term it this way, that there we speak of two natures before our recognition of their union, when we think of them in isolation from each other. So when we have not yet conceived of their union, and we are investigating those things which united. That's when we speak of two. But once we confess the union, that duality is abolished. So sometime we're going to cover all four of the letters, two letters of St. Cyril to Sassensus that were each in response to Sassensus, a bishop, uh, his letters to St. Cyril. The first letter he sent, then St. Cyril sent his response. Then the second letter of Sassensus comes to St. Cyril. Then St. Cyril sends the second letter. So this is the last in that string of letters. And he is responding to a certain argument that Sassensus is forwarding to him that he heard some Nestorians say. and they, But they didn't sound very Nestorian, is what Sassensus basically told St. Cyril. And that they actually sound like they're somewhat close to our faith. Because they will say that there are two natures after the union, but that they're inseparable. And so this is what St. Cyril says. He says that this objection is yet another attack on those who say that there is one nature of the sun. They want to show that the idea is foolish. Well, let me just let me just uh, clarify what the Escorus yeah. is saying. The people who say the people who say that there are two natures after the union in one person and their natures are inseparable and whatever, but there's still two natures after the union. Look at what Cyril is saying about them. And he's responding to those it. exact people. I'm gonna I'm gonna read it, Diosco. Sure. So he's saying this objection 
the objection that there are two natures after the union in one person and their inseparable natures. That's the objection. This objection is yet another attack on those who say that there is one incarnate nature of the Son. They want to show that the idea is foolish and so they keep on arguing at every turn that two natures endured. They have forgotten. This is St. Cyril, guys. They have forgotten, however, that it is only those things that are usually distinguished at more than a merely theoretical level which split apart from one another in differentiated separateness and radical distinction. Let us once more take the example of an ordinary man. We recognize two natures in him, for there is one nature of the soul and another of the body. But we divide them only at a theoretical level and by subtle speculation. Rather, we accept the distinction only in our mental intu intuitions, and we do not set the natures apart, nor do we grant that they have a radical separateness. But we understand them to belong to one man. This is why the two are no longer two, but through both of them, the one living creature is rendered complete. The extra word, inseparable, they add may seem to have our orthodox sense, but that is not how they intend it. Now that's powerful what he just said. He's saying even if you say they're inseparable, but you still say they're two, then you're not speaking our language. You're not affirming our theology. You understand? Guys, they're quoting accurately. So I wanna I hope William, my brother in the Lord, the Roman Catholics, we're gonna watch these series to prepare because they said they're coming January 13 and Eastern Orthodox, please, brethren read these quotes address them for our benefit because if you just get into the technicality of it we need a response from the other side to what these saints of the church said you can say metaphysically it's not coherent but still the citations are there for our benefit it needs to be addressed notice what is being said by saint cyril look what it's being said even if you say the two natures are inseparable you're not using our language. We don't speak that way. One composite nature. One nature after the union. So stop talking about two natures, though they're inseparable. Speak as we speak. One nature. Yes, we know there are two natures. Divine nature, human nature. But after the union, they're inseparable. See that? Look what he says, the last line. The extra word inseparable, they add, may seem to have our orthodox sense, but that is not how they intended. Right. So if that's uh, if not misunderstanding, he's saying, look, you can say inseparable all you want. If you're going to keep affirming two natures, then you're going to run into a problem because the conclusion is going to end up being Nestorianism. Stop saying that. Just say one nature after you in one nature. So I want to hear the other side, but I want the citations of these men to be dealt with. Metaphysics is OK, but for me, I want to see how. They will deal with the pre-schism fathers. I really need an answer for that, for my own edification. Now, brethren, uh, it's over two hours. Before we wrap this up, I want to know. I'm available Friday or Saturday. What is most convenient for you guys? So let's um, let's say Saturday because for Mejd is better. Right, Mejd? Yeah, I think so. I mean, okay. the thing, I, I might do it on Friday. I'm don't, don't, not, not sure okay. about well, Get back to me today then. Yeah, okay. okay. Let us know well, today. Well, I want you to do two because I delayed it. I had stuff happening, personal issues. But I want two sessions to get the ball rolling. So Lord willing, it'll either be Friday or Saturday. He'll let me know today, Lord willing. So guys, you learn. Now, What one thing that I appreciate is what Kiri Leeson said. She goes, now hearing this presentation, now she appreciates the fact there was a lot of misunderstanding and because when you don't understand something it makes it easier for you to demonize the other person but now they see wow it's not as heretical as i was told even if they don't accept it and say well we'll find a way to explain or we have answers but it's not as heretical and damnable blasphemous as i was told that's why i say to you guys proverbs 18 17 proverbs 18 17 the first to present his case seems right. The first until his neighbor comes and questions him. All my life I was hearing Baptists bashing Catholics and Orthodox, and I thought they were demons. If I shut my mind and not open myself to hearing the other side, 
I would be attacking the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church to this day. But thank the Lord he had mercy on me. Now, I'm going live in 45 minutes, Lord willing. Here's the link. I'm going to have to do a coffee run, so I may be a few minutes late. 45 minutes, proving Muhammad is not the paraclete. We're going to go in-depth exegesis of John. But brethren, final words so we can wrap it up for the glory of Christ. Thanks again, Sam, for these. Uh, thanks for continuing to bring us on. Um, please, guys, pray for us. Um, and uh, check out our channel. At yes, my name. I want to link to it. I'm sorry, brother. I keep forgetting to link to it. It's okay, it's okay Aziza. Thank you, guys. All pray for us, and we're praying for you. And uh, remember Maria in your prayers. I, I mentioned her name in the, in the comments. Yes, go ahead. And, uh, you, brethren, any last words on your part? Just that that last quote where it says the two are no longer two. Remember, <laughs> listener, that you already saw that in the Council of Ephesus from St. Theodotus homilies. So you see they're speaking in the same mind. Amen. So they're in unison. They're in uniformity. What about you, Maggot? Thank you again for having us, Sam. Uh, yeah. That's it, brother. So let me know. Friday said, and my, remember, you'll always be my favorite maggot. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. God bless you. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Brethren, I got to do a coffee run. See you in 45 minutes, Lord willing. In-depth exegesis of John. Again, the Trinity, Christ as God in flesh, and the Holy Spirit as divine person, and Muhammad is in hell. Glory to Jesus Christ. Mananathe. Take care, everybody. Mananathe.